morning. My name is Murray Palmer and uh, the British uh, Columbia Aviation Museum and we're doing a video on or correction, a PowerPoint project on riveting and uh, re-riveting. Basic information uh, so that we can move forward on the Lancaster project or any other sheet metal project that we've got here. Uh, we need to use a standard and the standard that we use is going to be a structural repair manual which is down here in the, in the lower section of us uh, for the type certificate of the aircraft or AC 431382B and this is a, 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 um, a basis of all, re, all structural repairs on all aircraft and the AC 43 came prior to the structural repair manual sort of thing so anyway we will work with those two, two uh, documents to recreate the aircraft as we need it. Uh, Aircraft metallic structural principles. Uh, we have to be aware of what we're dealing with with the aircraft. We can't do a repair without making sure that it meets the original standard. So we'll come across a number of different things that we'll basically deal with, but we have to make sure that wherever a repair is done, it will meet the requirements of the manufacturer or AC43. Now, we will have numerous different rivets that we're going to work with. And I think I went through with you in the past, the four basic ones that we're going to work with is going to be a 332, a 1 inch, a 532nd, and a 316th. There are also quarter inch and 3 8 and so on and so forth. I think we won't be working with those. We don't have the equipment to handle that. So the, 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 three that we're, the four that we'll work with is 332nd, 1 8 532nd, 3 16 when we're working with this, the manufacturer has already set out and figured out all of the, uh, the layout schemes for the number of rivets, for the amount of material, and so on and so forth to get the strength that's necessary. We don't have to go figuring any of that stuff out. There are formulas, but we don't have to do it. It's already there. If we're going to do a repair, an actual repair, as opposed to taking a skin off and putting a new skin back on, we will use that area uh, that has already got a rivet pattern and we'll use the spacing from that area to do the repair that we're going to put in. So if there's you know, a, a set of rivet, or rivets every half an inch in our repair, that's what we'll be using as well in that area. If it's, the rivets are three inches apart, then we'll do a similar kind of a repair, okay? So just as long as you understand that, that that as the stresses in the aircraft build up around the engines, the landing gear, or the main sections where it connects together sort of thing, those carry an awful lot of stress. And you're going to find that there's going to be heavier rivets and they're going to be closer together. As they get further apart and as they get further out on the aircraft, you go to the tips of the wings and the very tail of the airplane, the rivet spacing is quite far apart because there's not heavy loads out there. It all transfers into the center section of the aircraft from the engines and, and what we want to do is make sure that we've got those uh, and able to carry the loads that we've got. Rivets are used in shear <coughs> and what we need basically do is this is the most common joint that we're going to ever find, the, what they call a lap joint. This here is a double shear we won't see that very often. It, it does happen, but we're not going to get worried about it. If we have to do a repair or we have to re replace a skin, I'll be, and so will Grant, be right on top of all of the stuff that's going on with that to make sure that we follow the particular rules. Now, it should be a 2117. That's the standard rivet. This AD is the material that is being manufactured out of it. The lower, the one that's just below that, this one down here, the D2017, is what they call an icebox rivet, and so is this DD2024. If you notice, the structural, the strength of these things, the tensile strength of them, is higher than what it is on the 2117s. 2117, the most common rivet we're going to work with. Okay, on um, the diameters that we are going to be working with, there's a 332, 1 8, 5 32nd, 316. Those are the most common. We do have some 1 16th inch rivets, and, I'll, and as I said, all the way up to 3 8 We're not going to get too concerned about either end of that. We might have to deal with the odd 1 16th inch rivet, but most of the time we won't. 
So, the general rule to determine the proper diameter of the rivet for a single lot joint is the proper diameter is equal to three times the thickness of the material that we're working with. So, if we have, say, for instance, a 40 thou skin, um, we would take, to figure out the length, we would take three times that, which would give us 0.125, which the closest rivet size to that would be 0.125 which is a 1 8 inch rivet. So that's what we'd end up working with. So if we're going to work with a 40 thou thick skin, minimum rivet size is going to be 1 8 inch. That's just a means that we, of how we determine that kind of stuff. And again, we're not going to have to do a whole bunch of calculations figuring this thing out. It's just a matter of, if we're doing our repair, we would want to measure it and make sure that we've got the right size. And that's what we would deal with. Uh, okay, moving on from there, we've got uh, basic strengths of the rivets. It's amazing actually what a single rivet will, will, will hold. The idea behind putting rivets in the aircraft is that the rivets shear and not tear the skin out. Okay? When you have a row of rivets, um, if, if there has been an, an accident or a, say a stressing of the skin maybe or something like that, and the skin has actually torn there was a problem. They, had, they didn't have the right size rivets in there for the right for the design of the of the component. The whole idea is that if it's overloaded, a rivet will shear, and you can lose one rivet, two rivets, ten rivets out of a row of a hundred, and, and and it's not going to really affect the strength of that particular joint. But if that skin tears, then you got no strength left in it. So this is a chart that gets used to figure out what we're basically doing and working with, I should say. So. Here's some of our rules of thumb. Probably driven head is one and a half diameters of the rivet shank. Okay, we can get down, we can measure it. But we created a rivet gauge the other day. That rivet gauge takes into consideration this one and a half diameters for width and for now, for the proper length coming out. It also shows us that one and a half diameters after we have put, this, put the rivet gauge up against the skin and when we've, we'll, we got this morning, we'll work with that a little bit more. This is just some numbers. This is just calculations. Every single rivet that you use, you can come up and calculate these numbers if you want to, but the rivet gauge will tell you everything you need to know without having to go through the calculations. So there's the basic standard that we're talking about. The rivet itself, once it comes through the skin, will have a diameter and a half hanging out, but after it's been bucked, it becomes a diameter and a half wide. That's standard procedure. You can go down to about one third a diameter, uh, or sorry, this should be, excuse me, this should be a half a diameter thick, I should say. If it's less than that, we could even get away with one third of the diameter and probably still not get too concerned about it as long as it has the proper shape to it. And if you notice, there's a little bit of a, a rounding to the edge of that. Everything's perfectly flat, 90 degrees to the center of that rivet. So that's the important thing that we're, we're trying to work with. If we have a problem if we put this at an angle, the, the, what we call the shop head or the buck head at an angle, we've got some problems and we'll end up having to drill it out, okay? So this is standard, this is the, the, the thing. We do have a little bit of room to move, like I said, one third, and you can go a little bit higher than one half the thickness. Uh, you know, you could probably come down to there, uh, but I wouldn't go much beyond that, okay? The whole idea behind this, creating this head, is to keep it, keep the skins together. We don't want separations between these skins here, because if we have separation, moisture, dirt, everything else is gonna get into it, and we're gonna have a problem with corrosion setting up. So we have to be very careful in our layups uh, that we don't have that skin. And we'll, I'll teach you how to, uh, how to make sure that we don't have that uh, in, in our layups. So we can use, if we don't have the right size of rivets, and we'll get into, <coughs> into the rivet sizes, uh, we do have, have rivet cutters that we can cut long rivets to the size that we need. The rivets that we're working with, pretty soft. You just take the pin, Drop the rivet in, slice it off, and away you go. You have to deal with it with the very tip getting slightly distorted in a rivet cut. You might have a hard time to fit it into the hole, but we'll we'll talk about that when we get into the shop again. 
So there's a, what the set of rivet cutters look like. I've got a set with me this morning. On, when we go to the shop, I'll show you how, to, how those work. You can, and there's all the different sizes, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's the smallest hole, which is a 332nd, you go all the way around the far side of this curve, and there, right there is another hole that's using this gauge for a depth gauge. Uh, oh, sorry, there it is. Can't even see it. There's the long rivet right there in that 1/8 inch. That's a 1/8 inch rivet sticking out underneath. It shears at that line right there. And so you need to set these little adjusters and away you go. We don't want to get into that. It's too cumbersome to start cutting rivets, but you do it if you have to. You're never stuck if you've got a long rivet. You can always make a short rivet to the size that you need. The big thing is we always want to buy the correct size. And so we'll figure out before we start doing a repair what the correct length should be and we'll make sure that we've got those sizes with us at the time. Just talking about what the engineers have done to create the aircraft. So again, we don't have to worry about that. As long as we go to that area and we, re we replicate the original design, we're golden. Nobody's going to have any issues with it from Transport Canada's point of view. But here's one of the things that we do have to deal with. Is it called edge distance? And this is vitally important. If we're going to deal with, and I will do a drawing here right now. Now, edge distance is vitally important in what we're going to do. So here's our skin. I'll get on this side. Okay, so there's our skin. And we need to, we're, we're going to put a row of holes that we come along here. And I don't work, I don't write with my left hand, by the way. Anyway, um, so what we need to do is determine edge distance. The edge distance comes from this skin, and it comes from this skin. And if we're building a patch, and we, we need to build it, we have to determine from here to here where the first hole comes. All the rest of the holes literally line up through the center line. Edge distance is measured from the center of the rivet to the edge of the material. And basically what we're dealing with is uh, a, a 2 to a 4 rivets pitch, what they call pitch, basically. And what we're dealing with is the diameter of the rivet. So if this is 1 8 inch rivet that we've got here, we would have to have from the center of this a minimum of 1 quarter of an inch. Two rivets. So the, this two diameters to four diameters, anywhere in between that is fine. So four diameters is going to give us one half inch. Um, okay? So our maximum, we can move up from here to here, will be down to one half inch, and from this corner to this corner, one half inch, to there, and then we could run a row there. Our minimum is going to be two diameters, which is one quarter of an inch, and it runs that length. We cannot, we can't vary with that. Now, this is for universal head rivets, uh, and if we're working with a universal head rivet, we're going to be, uh, this would be the system we would use. If we're going to go to a countersunk, this changes to 2.5 by 4. Okay, now 2.5, and, and the reason that we have to go to a 2.5 diameter spacing is that when we countersink that material, we're actually taking material away from the the center of that to the edge of that. So it has to come in a half an inch. So we just have to do the calculations to figure out where we're going to go. So, so it, it would be uh, an, an, uh, three sixteenths, three sixteenths to one and a half inch, anywhere in between that for countersunk. And we haven't done anything with countersunk at all in the past, so we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to the shop. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. I'm worried about the universal right now, and that's what we mostly have. Okay. There's our charts. We can figure out what we need for sizes. We're talking about pitch. Pitch is from the center one hole to the center of the next hole, and so on. The distance between the two rows of rivets, and rivets can be close, uh, can be no closer than three diameters. When, we, when we've got a row of rivets, unless the manufacturer has done them less than that, we can't. Okay. Um, most of the diameters will be up to 12. Is be the absolute longest distance you're going to find. It can go a little bit more. If you're closer than that, does that fatigue the metal? Yes, it does. You don't have enough material from one hole to the next, and that starts to weaken it. And it changes the tensile strength. 
Uh, well, it would, yes. It would change okay. the, the tensile strength, the, the bearing, let's call, let's call it bearing strength. So it's much more of a bearing strength than it would be a tensile strength. The tensile strength won't change, the bearing strength would. Okay. So there's basically what I'm re referring to. This is just your row of rivets, your major spacing that you want. We're dealing with, with, with uh, in this particular situation, an edge distance of two and a half diameters. Now, if you notice this dotted line here, that's the edge of the skin underneath. You can't see that. But you have to take into consideration two and a half diameters or two diameters, depending on which one we're working with, from this one, as well as from that one, from this one to there. So you get, there's a number of things that get, you can get caught in a trap for younger players. And we don't want to do that. Okay. So we've got the gauge, which we call Traverse Pitch. Gauge now is if we're going to do two rows of rivets. And that's the distance from the center of one row of rivets to the center of the other row of rivets. And that's running parallel. They don't have to be straight across from each other. They can be bounced around. They can, they can go at a diagonal. Should have a drawing here in the day. The distance between a row of rivets and a multi-row layout should be 75% of the pitch. And there's just little rules that we'll deal with. So here's what we call pitch, or a gauge, I should say. It's like the railroad track. And that's how they figure this thing out. You got one track here, you got one track here, you got a row of rivets and a row of rivets. And like I said, in the real world, it doesn't matter if this is straight across or if it's pitched like that. It's still creating enough area. When you get a lot of rivets close together, this pitch setting is easier to deal with because then you don't worry about that minimum three diameters. Inches. <coughs> Okay. I used this machine. Oh, a tongue depressor. <laughs> and then I'll do mine when you're finished. Yeah. Or have you done yours? No. Okay, I'll do you, mine. Yours no. you do yours and I'll do mine. Doesn't matter, but they all got to get done. So. Yeah, we'll, oh. we'll work through the progression. <laughs> well, we only did need to do them. Single one, right? Yep. And we'll drill them all through together. Get there. You're going to drill, you're going to go in the middle of the gap. This is going all the way up. So we can get the way back. Bring it back a little bit so that we're just touching, and you just touch it, then you can put the mark right on the line, right? <coughs> Big two. Big two. There we go. That's going to look better. Probably be here till about seven o'clock. Yeah, I'm actually okay. There's overtime, right? So I, no, I'm gonna move yeah. my chair over here. Oh, okay. Because then I've got the, the light in the right spot. I think. Number forty, right? Yeah. Oh, hello. Now we can get ready. What we've got is a pin device that opens and spreads, opens and closes by the center protruding through it and it locks around a hole. And the whole idea is it's a, a temporary fastener 
that we're working with just to put it in, hold it for what we need it for the length of time, and then remove it when we want to remove it. And then we release the pin, and the pin pops out in the center, forcing the two flanges on the outside to, to expand, and now it holds. This will not come out unless we use these clicker pliers to remove it. And we put it back in. It's a temporary fastener while we're fitting up to rivet it. So, now, all the way around? Ah, that's cool. These aren't perfectly square, so there could, there could be... They were cut by me. Okay, okay. Didn't go deep enough. You're going to have to go deeper into your material. You have to go fairly deep. You probably wow. have to go just sort of right through, but not quite. There, now, put that in. All right, I forgot all about that. Yep, and now, that, what ends up happening, yep, push it in and, and then just release it. Now, you see how good that is? Oh yeah. And yep. Pattern. But if we go here, it's close on enough. a corner. Yeah, I'm not gonna worry about it. But so does that not tend to square. violate a rule? It would. It it would in, 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 real life, of... in real life, it would. And what we'd end up having to do is repositioning all of these holes to get the correct spacing. Right? Again, if we're gonna work on that, we just walk up there, we measure whatever that is, and then we're gonna do a bit of eyeballing. Okay. Now, if I'm doing a complete layout and I'm, I'm working with students, for instance, you know, like when you went to school, you're forced to doing every single step. Sorry, I'm not going to worry about this because, yes, you're violating a rule, but we're still, we're not with the rule of other. We're with the closer than that pitch setting. But I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, so you would still. Yeah, it's simple. You want your corner. Deeper, all we're going to do is, is, is that. Nothing more than that. And when we, when we do that, we take off a little bit of material, gets peeled off of the very edge of the holes, and we've gotten rid of all of the uh, stress risers, and that's all we're concerned with. Now that's one style, I'll do that one. And this is just, it's a little bit quicker maybe because it has a pilot and I can just drop it into the hole. I can get specific size where I got a pilot that fits the hole exactly. I don't have to use that if I don't want to sort of thing. And there are other ones that are power tool operated. Check it, put it in, does it fit perfect, perfectly? If it fits perfectly, that's the one you want to use. I don't care what's written on it. It doesn't make any difference. That's the All I'm doing now the is... The transport team, when they inspected it... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Keep videoing. Okay. I just lost it. Okay. First, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on there and I'm going to pull my trigger to find out how the gun is set. Because I haven't used this gun for months. Probably a year or better. But I have no idea what it was set up. I don't know. So I've got... So that's not bad. I'm going to turn it down slightly and I just, just tighten it. On here I've got different numbers. It doesn't mean a heck of a lot. It's just a reference sort of thing. So all I'm going to do is I just turn it one, a little wee bit and I test it again. It's going to be long enough to start with. Now, what I should have is I should have a few more clicos because see what's happening? See how this is have to spread? spread? So I, and for what we're demonstrating here, it doesn't make any difference which way these go. I'm going to have to be, I'm going to rivet this way so you guys can see it. Um, I could do it the other way around, it doesn't make any difference. You, get, you can get fairly proficient with it. I'm putting a few in here right now and all I'm doing is just putting them in to hold it in place. So it doesn't make any difference, you can see I got from, from both directions. If I'm setting this thing up, probably what I'd like to do is have approximately that many all the way around, and down here I'm, I'm holding it steady, I don't really care. This vise stronger than what these are, so I'm happy with that. I can put this thing, you know,
Do you start uh, on a corner or no. do you start on a in middle? the middle? Just like the okay. suturing. Yep. Yeah, I always want to start in the middle. And I'll, I'll show you why here in a second. This time we'll put us in, test it, get our number four out, and guess what? Pretty much bang perfect. on exactly where we want to be. I okay. Found that's the right length in other words. Yep, it's exactly the right length for what we want to do. So now I'm set up with that. I've got different bucking bars, okay? And you tell me which one's heavier. Mm, I think the actual, this is more dense than yeah, this. Yeah, this is titanium, okay? This is just steel. These things here are really expensive, but man, they are a beautiful bucking bar to use technique. What I do is I hold the bucking bar in my hand like this and I use this part of my skin of my, my finger and my thumb to keep the, the bucking bar away from the material. Because if I get this thing bouncing around and it hits this material, it's going to put a mark on my material. And I don't want that to happen. So I need to have a cushion. So I just use my fingers like that up against the skin in that manner. And you see I get my bucking bar on there and I'm gonna I want to look at my bucking bar. I'm more concerned about this side than I am this, this side. This side's very important and I don't want to damage it. But this side I can screw it up in a second if I don't do it correctly. Okay? You guys might go, okay I can't I can't discern at this point in time. One one between one and ten. So you want to go for about two to three seconds in one shot. If you go two to three seconds in one shot, two to about two and a half seconds is usually enough. You don't want to go beyond that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that from one and a half diameters sticking out to a half a diameter high, okay? And from one diameter wide to a diameter and a half wide, all right? So I'm just going to do this now. When I do this, See, there's lots of play. I got I, there's a number of things I got to take into consideration. I want to hold this as steady as I can. I can drop it down a little bit more. It's nice when this is rigid. rigid. You don't have to, to fight with it. But in, and for what we're doing today, again, all I'm doing, thumb and this finger is the cushion to hold it where I want it to be. Now I want to be in perfectly 90 degrees. My rivet gun, 90 degrees. My bucking bar, 90 degrees. Okay. So once it's there, then I, I basically I look. I put pressure on this side. I'm pushing that rivet in. I need it cannot move because when, if it if it's if I don't put enough pressure on, what will happen? It'll bounce out and it'll rivet halfway in, and that's no good either. So I need to keep that right where it has to be. So I just push this in like this, and I, this can be sideways like this. It doesn't make any difference as long as as long as I've got some kind of cushion. So now I I've, I've, I've put that in there. I'm pressing this way, and I'm also putting some pressure on with my left hand too. And then I just pull the trigger and I count to 10. And then I go, okay, is that where I need to be? And I take my gauge and I put it on there and it's slightly high, it's slightly proud, but it's close enough that I'm not gonna get worried. Yeah, so if, 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 if I had screwed it up and got it bouncing, you wouldn't, first of all, you wouldn't see the circle, the, the center of the shaft, and it wouldn't have spread out sort of thing. So the other thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure Width-wise, when you go like that, there's our width. We've got our width of our bucking bar. So this little gauge tells us everything. Okay. There. So see, I'm already pushing a little bit. I bring this up. I straighten it up. I put enough pressure on it. I'm holding this in. My fingernail, my th or my, th my, th my thumb, and my finger is acting as a cushion. And then I just hold it and I go, okay. Um. And. I counted to about 10 hits on that one. I'm just going to get my little gauge out here and go. We're, uh, you know, it's 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 just right there. I don't want to get too flat. You don't have to put a lot of pressure on it, you know, but you have to put enough to hold it. Okay. So I want to put. A, I'm going to damage a couple of things just so that you understand where I'm where I'm going. So I'm going to go off of it a little bit. So now. Now you can see the damage, and that's not acceptable. Oh, right. Yeah. Was that, that right good. at the edge of the bar? I, I brought the bar over, you can see where the bar 
came yeah, off yeah. and bucked on the skin, yeah, the damaged skin, yeah. the skin. Okay, so this is yeah. why it's so important mm -hmm. to make sure that you got that cushioned in there, okay? Okay, and you see this here? That's called a smiley. Oh, okay. You see the damage right. that yes. I did? Right. So I can see that? Yeah, the smiley is a little dent right above the, the river where my fingernail is. And that's caused from the that's, game that's caused from the from the the rivet snap hitting. You know, if I can't see this side and I can't get to it, well, somebody might be driving the buck and bar for me, or somebody might be driving the rivet gun. Doesn't make any difference as long as I know, as long as you focus on that, not not the other side of it, sort of thing. Okay. So all I do here now is is, is again cushion that cushion that buck and bar so it doesn't move, and away you go.